connect to the internet. All right, so maybe they have me up and recording by now, which was good because I didn't have internet anyhow, so I couldn't do anything. So at any rate, um, let's take a look at the floating example that we had last time, and we'll explore a few things with it, and then we'll get into um, some more, um, uh, we'll, we'll use the floating technique with um, the prototype that we've been working on. Um, for the past couple of class sessions. Or we can all watch me take a nap here, <laughs> which looks like about the only thing that's going to be working today.
All right. Including my fingers. There we go. All right. We had this example last time. And the way this works, again, is we use floating with this. So with floating, I'm floating these two blocks to the left, which means that it sees if it can fit the two blocks next to each other, side by side. It sees if there's enough space to do that. If there's enough space, fine. That's what we'll do. We'll put them right next to each other. If there's not enough space, <coughs> So like if the window gets narrower, it will drop down the one block alongside. And you can see exactly where that hits. It drops it down below. So let's, like, let's take a look at the code that does that. We have a width of 600 and a width of 900, and we float both of them, I'm sorry, width of 600 and width of 300 for a total of 900 pixels. Um, and in other words, if 900 pixels can fit side by side, in other words, if the width of the screen is 900 pixels or greater, it will put them side by side. If the width of the screen is less than 900, it will drop them below each other. All right? Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, where some of the issues come in is when you start mixing, when you start using percentages, and when you start mixing percentages and pixels. For example, if I were to make this 60% instead of 60 pixels, or 600 pixels, and 30%. looks roughly the same. As we make it smaller, it makes it narrower and narrower. And it keeps it the same. And it keeps it alongside of each other the whole way, right? Which sort of makes sense, right? I mean, 60% plus 30% is 90%. 90% is always going to be less than 100% of the whole screen. So if it's just purely percentages, you're probably OK. What gets to be a problem is if you mix percentages and absolute numbers, if you throw in something like a minimum width, or if you put a value for margin or padding or something like that, if I put a border. So for example, let's put a border around each of these. 10 pixels, solid, black. And let's put a padding, or let's put a margin of 50 pixels. Let's do 20 pixels instead. So now if we look at it, It's never on the same page. It's now on the same line, rather. Why? Because remember that we add the border and the margin to the total width of something. So if there is 1,000 pixels wide, if the screen is 1,000 pixels wide, and I say that it is 
60%. The total width is not 60%. The total width of the content area is 60%. But on top of that, you add the border, which is 20 pixels. So that would be 20 pixels on each side, so you're up to 640 pixels. And then you have a margin of 20 pixels. So that would be, uh, again, an additional 20 pixels on each side. So I kind of lost track of my addition, but you're up to 680 pixels, I think. All right. And then similarly, instead of 300 pixels, it would be 380. So 680 plus 380 is more than 1,000. So we'll never put those things side by side. All right. Now, so that's something to take into account as you're doing this. All right. Let's say we make this 50% instead. Then, at a certain width, they'll be side by side. But if I get smaller in a certain amount, then it drops down. Again, the reason for that, even though I'm using a percentage, um, the percentage um, you add, have to add on the border and the margin on both sides. Yes. Did you have a question? Oh, no, I just. Right. In between them. And again, remember that marg or margins don't add up. So there's. 20 pixels here and 20 pixels there. It doesn't add up the 20 and 20 and make it 40. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Right. Right. That's a little confusing. When you put a margin on something, you're saying it needs to be this far away from its neighbor. So if I say this one needs to be 20 pixels away from its neighbor, and this one needs to be 20 pixels away from each neighbor, that can be accomplished if they're 20 pixels away from each other. You don't have to put them 40 pixels away from each other to accomplish that. All right. So it's a little confusing at first, but if you think about it, it makes sense. All this is saying is I want at least 20 pixels between this and its nearest neighbor. And same thing here. So it doesn't add them up to make 40 pixels. It, uh, if, if it puts them 20 pixels apart, well, then it achieves both of those goals. All right. I'm going to get rid of this. And I'm going to do a mix of percentages and absolute numbers as far as the width go. So I could make the width 50% of for the article, and I could maybe make the width 600 or uh, 200 pixels for the aside. So we start out, it looks like that. As I bring it down, at a certain point, again, it's going to drop down below. Or if I do a minimum width, I might make the width 50 pixels, or 50%, but I might make a minimum width. Four hundred pixels, or three hundred pixels, let's say. Then it will put these side by side, and as I make it narrower, at a certain point, it stops making the blue section smaller because I've hit the minimum width. And if I make it any smaller than that, as soon as it touches the border of that, that drops down. Now I can see where this would be a little confusing. Um, um, not confusing as far as the concept goes, but again, where, what makes this confusing is number one, um, when you start mixing things together. If I'm just using fixed widths, then it's pretty obvious. If I make one 500 pixels and one 300 pixels, as long as there are 800 pixels going across, it'll fit. If I get lower than 800, it won't fit, and it will drop the other one below. All right. Um, where it gets confusing and where you have to sometimes play around with it and look at it is if you're mixing percentages and absolute pixel sizes, if you throw a minimum width on something, and if you start throwing margins and padding, because remember the margins and padding add up um, to comprise the total width of the element that you're having. Okay, any questions about this? 
Let's go and let's take, <coughs> excuse me, let's go and let's take the prototype that we were working on last time and let's make a fully floating version of it. All right. So, why are we concerned about this in the first place? I think it's a good, good idea to revisit that. Why, are we, why do we even care about this in the first place? Well, we want our pages to be flexible and to accommodate the different size screens that they're liable to be displayed in. All right? And again, this is especially relevant when you talk about viewing a web page on a mobile device versus a desktop device. Pages on a mobile device, how do they compare to pages on a desktop device, typically? What's true about websites when you view them on a mobile device versus when you view them within, from, from a regular computer? The screens are narrower, all right. And what does that mean? How, how should the design accommodate that? Well, for one thing, multiple columns probably isn't a good idea, all right. So some of the wireframes that I sketched out um, previously, and we'll use this as our basis, on a desktop screen, it looks nice to have a layout that looks like this. All right, that looks good. All right, it's good that the content doesn't go all the way across because that's hard to read. If I had a paragraph that went all the way across the screen, that's very difficult to read. Your eyes, tends to gra your eyes tend to gravitate either up or down a little bit. And it makes it difficult to read. So that's why, like in newspapers, things are printed in columns. That's why things don't go all the way across a newspaper normally. You have little columns. That way it's easier on your eye to follow the line across because your eye doesn't have to travel as far as a distance. Well, that's how it would look like on a computer screen. How would it look like on a, on a mobile device? Well, depending on what you did, either it would look like one of these two options. Either it would look like this, and so much of the content would be off the screen, or it would look something like this and this content might be tiny and hard to read. So, what often is done and what's often desirable and this can be accomplished through the float attribute is make it like this. If I view a page on a desktop machine on a wide width it's going to look like this. Two columns for our navigation and content. If I view it on a desk, uh, on a mobile device, it's going to look like this, one column, where I have my header, my navigation, my content, and my footer. Now keep in mind these aren't drawn to scale, right, because a, a, a mobile device would be small compared to a computer screen. So it would look more like this. All right, so let's see how we can get that approach by floating. In fact, if your concern is to make your make a web page that is looks good both on a desktop and on a um, uh, a mobile device, your starting point is to use a floating layout. So let's go and let's do that with the prototype that we worked on last time. I'm going to pick one of these as my starting point. I'm going to pick this one as my starting point. So I'm going to copy template three. I'm going to 
to call this template six. Edit this guy in Notepad. All right. And what I'm going to do typically for this is I'm going to use percentages, floats, and minimum widths. I might in some cases use, well, we'll see what all we're going we're we're to use. So I'm going to do this a, a bit at a time. So with the header, I'm going to start out, and I'm going to say the width I want to be 100%. float left. The navigation, I'm also going to want to make it float left. And I may make it a width of thirty percent and a minimum width of two hundred pixels. An article I might make it float left. And I might make a width of 50% and a minimum width of 400 pixels. I'm, I'm just sort of eyeballing this and we'll see how this works when, when we're all done. The footer, I'm going to make a width of 100%. And I'm also going to tell it to float left. So let's save this and let's see what we got. It probably won't be perfect at first, but we can then play with it. All right. Actually, I wouldn't say that's perfect, but that's pretty much what I was looking for. Yes? So basically the float. Yet, yeah. any of the, any of the, any of the things that we have done with positioning, whether they be position absolute, position fixed, position relative, overrides the browser's normal flow. All right. So the float is another way that we take it out of the flow, and we we control the position. So absolutely. All right. So now look what happens. As we go across, and at a certain point, that will pop down. So, if I was viewing this on a large screen, it would look like this, which again, it's not perfect, but it doesn't look bad. If I were to view this on a smaller screen, it would look more like that. Which, again, is sort of typical to how mobile pages work. All right? A lot of times you'll see mobile pages being single column pages instead of multiple column pages. All right, so as I, as I click around and go to About Us page, it looks like that. Now, this isn't the only thing that we can do to optimize for a mobile device. You know, we have a whole course in mobile web development that looks at taking a website and making sure it works optimally 
across different platforms. But this is a good first step, all right? <coughs> By using floating layouts, using percentages, we can, it's a, it's a good first step in the, in the right direction. There's a whole slew of other techniques that we can use. And we'll explore a couple of them in this class, and the rest of them will be, uh, are covered in the mobile web development class. But the starting point is using not fixed layouts, but using, um, using floating. Uh, can you imagine if we were to view our fixed layout, which was, I think, this example. Actually, that was our, that was our, not our fixed layout, but our, um, yeah, that was our fixed layout. I meant our absolute layout. All right. Can you imagine viewing that on a small screen? We'd have to do a lot of sideways scrolling to see our content. And that is something that isn't particularly good. Now, in our floating example, we still have to do a little bit of scrolling, but it's up and down scrolling. And that generally is a little easier to do on a mobile device as you scroll through. So if this was smaller, we'd have to scroll this way a little bit. But that's okay. Now there's things that we could do to even optimize that further. For example, we could make these, you know, we could make this text a little bit smaller and would get more of it on the same page. Actually, let's go and do that. That will better illustrate uh, my point. So I can go in here and I can make the navig or the font size, I'll make 0.9M. I'll make it a little bit smaller. And this I'll only make 1.5M. And now when I save this, whoops, I don't want that. Now that looks more like you might find on a, on a mobile device. All right. Again, a simpler layout, yet still takes advantage if the screen is bigger. All right. Yes. So the actual content, the box, the borders around it, or the content around it, uh, you still would have to kind of scroll to the side because the minimum width is still. Yeah, and, and again, um, that's where um, there is a little bit of side scrolling. Um, that's where you would look to see what a typical narrow phone would be. Um, this is probably very narrow. Um, I could make the, I could change the minimum width on these things to be 400 pixels is still probably pretty small for a minimum width, but if I change it say to 350 pixels, then it should fit in without any side scrolling. Whoops. Yeah, almost there. <coughs> this is actually a very small screen. This, this, even though it might not be uh, apparent, you know, this is way smaller than any than any phone would be. All right. So that is probably like our screen has about has about a thousand pixels. So that probably is about 250 pixels wide. I mean, flip phones are probably bigger than that. All right. So um, probably a good width for a smartphone would be something like that. In which case, we could actually make those minimum widths even even a little bit bigger, and still be manageable. Um, Again, you know, this is a challenge of web development is that you really don't have any idea what platform <coughs> the person on the other end is going to be viewing your page on. You want to make it work across as many platforms as possible. It, however, is not going to look as awesome on every single platform. So, for example, you know, 
someone is using a flip phone from 2008, it's not going to look as good as if someone's using a brand new phone. All right? Really nothing you can do about that. If they have to do a little bit of side scrolling, well, that's, you know, how do I want to put it? I'm sure they're experiencing even worse stuff on the web with that phone than a little bit of side scrolling. All right. So you, you have to try to, you know, you want to make it work for everyone, but you don't want to take extraordinary means to deal with the, the, the lowest end case if it's going to compromise the, the site for the rest of the users. All right. Now, one thing I will say is when uh, in the mobile web development class, we study techniques where you can make a bare bones site for someone with the oldest phone possible that would still be workable and yet make a better looking site. You can actually look at the, the, the device and determine like what kind of device it is and create a web page accordingly based on the kind of device it is. So you can actually do some things to accommodate everyone. The question is, is how much effort that you want to put into it. And today, I think if we make an effort to make these this big, I think that's probably good enough for the effort that we're going to put into today. So this is sort of the, the <coughs> this is sort of the, the starting point for um, developing websites that are um, that work effectively in a mobile environment as well as in a uh, desktop environment. There are a few things within the Chrome browser that you can use that help you to do testing like that. So if I open up in Google Chrome, I can go in and there should be under developers tools. That's F12. Pardon me? I was just going to say the shortcut's F12. F12? I forget where the option is to, do you recall that, where the option is where you can set the... The mobile device? Yeah. Uh, at the, just at the top, in the left corner, there's the little... Gotcha. All right, there we go. We can select how it's going to look on an Apple iPad. How it's going to look like on a Blackberry. How it's going to look like with a laptop with a high density pixels per inch and so on. I'm trying to find a low end phone on here. At any rate, this gives you and then we can see how it looks both portrait and landscape. I used to suggest <coughs> people in my class download something called the Opera uh, Browser Mobile Emulator. And you can still do that, but um, a lot of that functionality is now included in, um, is included in um, um, Google Chrome. Um, this is a challenge, right? Because um, you can do your best to make it compatible across a bunch of different devices. But it's literally impossible to test it on every single device that people could view it on. So what are your options as far as testing it? Well, number one, you make sure your code is correct. All right? We'll talk about later on in the course, there are, there are things called validators, which look at your code and tell you if you've made any mistakes. They're like the spell check of web development. All right? You can... you put in your code and it will tell you, hey, you forgot a tag. Because a lot of browser compatibility issues are, are caused by the fact that you violated some of the rules of HTML. And one browser can, can handle it, 
another browser cannot. So that's sort of the first thing that you can do is make sure you follow the rules um, of HTML. The other thing you can do is you can, you can um, run emulators to test that. Problem with an emulator is an emulator isn't, device, it's, isn't the actual device itself. You're liable to run into bugs with emulator just like you'd run into a bug with any software. So that's a good step to follow, but it's not foolproof. Um, depending on the size of the organization, some organizations have little test environments, testing labs, where they will have machines configured in different ways and you can actually test your web pages on all of those. Um, when I do projects on, on, you know, on my own, I don't have big testing facilities. I test my pages on every device I can get my hands on and I ask my friends to do the same thing. All right? If I launch a new website, go to such and such and tell me if it works good. And if it doesn't work good, tell me what device you're on and then I can try to do some troubleshooting. The idea is, is following the rules isn't enough, unfortunately. You need to test to ensure because it's your website, you know. You can't, if, there's a, if there would happen to be a website that wouldn't display properly on an iPhone, for example, you can't tell everyone throw away your iPhones and get a Samsung, right? Because they're not going to do it. It's like, I'll just go to someone else's website then. Forget your website, all right? So therefore, it's up to you whether the fault is yours or not. It's up to you to test it. Another thing that is available is, and this is available once your site is on the web, is there are online cross-browser testing tools. And <coughs> A lot of these, a lot of these cost a certain amount, all right. But they give you like free trials and, and stuff like that, so you can check them out and see if they work for your organization. So, for example, let's say I was doing, I was a developer doing Cleveland State's website. Okay. Let's say I was doing Cleveland State's website. And that's how it looks on my browser. All right, looks pretty good. I could go in and put in that URL and say I want to test it. And in six minutes, I'll have an answer. All right. Now, why six minutes? Well, they want to annoy you by making it take a little bit of time. I really, well, we're, we're moving up the queue, so that's good. I say, I really wonder if there's actually other people testing it. There probably are, but, you know, they probably don't care because, you know, they want you to buy the premium, the developer plan. And <coughs> here we go. And this shows me what this will look like, what my page will look like on the particular test environment that I chose. In other words, on... I think I said um, Google Chrome uh, version 47 and Windows Vista. So I could go in and um, I don't know. It must be. So I could test with Firefox version 3.6. And that didn't seem to work well. I'm not sure if that's a problem with their emulator. Okay, so Firefox version 3.6, or, or I'm sorry, 1.8, or 18, it still looks pretty good. Let's test it on Internet Explorer. Uh, it only allows you to go back to Internet Explorer 9. I could test um, an old version of Google Chrome. And 
And again, all these are coming up reasonably good. But believe me, for some websites, especially if you went back for older uh, browsers, you would have problems. And the interesting thing is, why do you suppose you have to pay for the other versions of IE? IE is typically one of the more problematic browsers. All right, Firefox and Chrome tend to work the same way. And Firefox and Chrome tend to be very good as far as HTML5 compatibility and, and CSS compatibility and the such. Whereas typically IE tends to be the problem child. All right, so that's really probably what you would want to do your, a lot of your testing on. And so they're making you pay to do that. All right, which makes sense, right? I mean, they deserve to get paid for their services. Um, can't get everything for free. All right. <coughs> So that's another way that you can test it. The point is, though, is that testing is uh, something that is your responsibility as a developer. Now, in this class, there's no excuse not to test it on a couple of different browsers. I don't expect you to go and buy an iPhone and a, a, a Samsung Galaxy and, and all these things to test it across all these different devices. All right? um, but I do expect you to load, and there are in the lab, different browsers. So try it on a couple different browsers and make sure that it works. All right, that's the minimal that I would expect you to do, is try it on Internet Explorer, try it on Firefox, try it on Google Chrome. All the browsers are free. If you're running a Mac, you can get Firefox, Chrome, and Safari, and you can test those. So minimally, I would expect you to test across a, a couple different browsers. All right, um, we are by no means done with CSS layout. We're going to be talking about issues with that probably for the remainder of the semester. Um, after break, we'll probably spend a little bit of time talking about mobile layout. We'll talk a little bit more about validating our web pages. Uh, and then we'll go on from there. But again, for the rest of the semester, we're going to be hitting HTML and CSS in tandem. We'll, we'll go over something in CSS and go over something in HTML and see how they work together. After break, fairly quickly, I would say within two weeks, three weeks, your project design is due. So be aware of that. The break's a great time to rest and relax and have some fun. All right. It's a good time if you're behind to catch up on some things. Um, and it's a good time to get ahead of the game on some things, too. Um, I know it's only a week. It's going to be hard to do all of those things. All right. But at the very least, you know, it's getting to that point where you should be, uh, you should at least have a pretty good idea about what you're going to do with the project and what you need to do to complete the project design and so on. Do we have any questions about the project or the project design? <coughs> All right, this is going to be the rarest of rarities. I'm going to end a little bit early today. All right, um, so we'll see you up in lab.